everyone. Thank you for coming through this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, thank you for the great, uh, I guess, overview of how we got to this space specifically of me, um, of me creating this, this segment with you. Um, so I'm actually going to go right into my presentation only because part of my presentation today is telling my own story of rest and how, you know, how I've come to the place that I am right now in life based on some of the other experiences in my life. So you'll kind of get an overview of who I am and how I got to be doing this work um, through me telling my story a little bit about rest. <laughs> All right, so um, so kind of as Alpha has already um, maybe explained a little bit, the art of rest is really um, my, I don't know, the culmination of a, a bunch of work that I've done around rest and around um, yoga and meditation. And it is really an opportunity to share some information about rest and um, specifically about rest in the context of a... Um, of, of creative work, right? And creative work I think of as pretty broad. Um, creative work can be an artist, it can be someone who is curating events, it can be, um, you know, any, any time that you're cr creating, right, um, intentionally. And so what I have found is that rest is so integral in everyone's life, but especially to the work of creating. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, towards the bottom, you can see where you can um, find me elsewhere. Um, I'm on Instagram most, uh, I guess, like <laughs> most um, most frequently. <laughs> um, but then I also have a link tree there that has a lot of other things that I am doing and places where you can come take classes with me or do workshops with me. Um, and my website will be up shortly, but it is under construction right now, so it's not on there. Okay, so the last time that we spoke, we talked, I just want to like do a little quick recap. Um, we talked about defining rest and what rest actually means. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. Um, we talked about the current state of rest and how one third of Americans are sleep deprived. And that is only talking about sleep, which is not quite the same thing as rest is what we realized when we were defining rest. Um, our rest influencers, so people who influenced our stories and our understanding of rest. And then lastly, uh, we did a guided meditation that I led and um, we accessed a certain type of rest and we'll talk about types of rest today. So um, you'll be able to get an idea of like what guided meditation actually is in the realm of types of rest and, you know, digging into that definition a little bit deeper. So speaking of which, <laughs> um, there are seven types of rest as um, kind of explained to us by Sandra Dalton Smith. Um, she came up with the seven types of rest that every person um, experiences, but also that every person needs. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to have a full understanding of as do it as you start to do work around rest and kind of reclaim rest. Um, because what we talked about last time is that our society doesn't really influence us or um, doesn't really encourage us to value rest other than resting so that we can um, so that we can get up the next day and do more stuff, right? <laughs> um, so what we talked about last time is resting for the sake of rest and for our well-being rather than just resting so that you can get on to the next thing or so that you can be prepared for the next thing. Um, and so as far as the different types of rest, I'm gonna bring that back up. The first one is the most, I think like the most obvious, the one that comes to mind <laughs> for everyone, which is physical rest. So yeah, mental rest um, that is specifically talking about like getting out of your getting out of your brain and into your body. Sensory rest um, that is very specifically like overwhelm of the senses and learning how to um, how to undo that overwhelm or prevent that overwhelm. Emotional rest of your emotions, social rest, 
um, which can actually go both ways, social rest, like social rest, depending on who you are, um, could be finding social activities that are in like rejuvenating to you, or it can be that social in engagements are the thing tiring you and you need to have some alone time. Creative rest, which I feel like all of these can be kind of a sort of creative rest or can um, add to your ability to be creative, but there's actually a rest of being, of actually using your creative um, self. And then spiritual rest, which is, um, can be interpreted a few different ways. Um, but before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit about my rest story. And I, I started with giving our types of rest because as I tell my story, I think you'll see that there are like a number of places where I'm experiencing a need for every single type of rest that's on there. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to give my own story one so that you understand where I'm coming from, but also so that you can um, have a full understanding of kind of how these types of rest come up or how the need for each type of rest comes up. So the first part of my story is my mother's sigh and how it became mine. And this is um, something that I have just noticed about my mother for my whole life is that she does this thing where um, something can be going on specific or it could just be like she's had a long day, but she kind of sighs in this very dramatic way that I always felt like, oh, what's going on? And every time she'd be like, oh no, like it's nothing. Um, and it kind of is just like a, ah, you know, like very, um, a very strong sigh <laughs> of not quite relief, but um, of this, this feeling of releasing something. Um, and it always used to be like, oh, like what is wrong? You know, like, why are you, why are you sighing like this? Like there's something going on and then saying it's nothing. It felt like, oh, like it was like, I just didn't get it right growing up. Um, and recently we just had a moment where I was just having a really long day and I was, I was on the phone with her and I sighed just like she sighed. <laughs> she's like, I feel like it, it was, it was basically like, I remember you sighing like this mom and she's like, yeah, like, I think you get it. <laughs> I think you get it now as an adult. Um, and so basically just like the the things that weigh on us throughout our days whether it's um things that are frustrating like you know little things that we work through on a daily basis whether it is you know larger overarching things um like surviving capitalism and the way that we go through financial um ups and downs or um the kind of tiresomeness of dealing with race on a regular basis um and how that kind of influences almost every little thing that you do. Um, and this can be said about any part of your life, your gender, your sexuality, a lot of like our identity <laughs> um, dictates how we access rest and how often we access rest. And so I kind of just like as a, uh, a black woman raising three kids, uh, mostly on her own at that point in time, um, my mom was just tired, right? And tired in not a way that necessarily meant that she needs to go to sleep earlier, but tired in a way that like, okay, I'm raising these children, I'm figuring out life and trying to teach them to figure out life <laughs> or how to, uh, how to be a person at all, right? Um, and there's like some exhaustion that comes with that. And if in my mother's case, not really um, necessarily doing all the things necessary to quell all of those exhaustions, you end up with this like kind of overarching sigh of uh, life is heavy. Um, and so I noticed that in myself one day and it kind of was a wake up call of like, okay, I need to, I need to take care of myself better. Um, so going to school, coming back to like the idea of identity, um, you know, I think that we all as adolescents are really focused on like fitting in or standing out in some way or the other, right? We kind of want both. Um, we want to fit in enough that we feel like we belong, um, but then we want to stand out enough that we feel like we're special and that we're worthwhile and that we have a purpose that is specific to ourselves. Uh, and this was like a huge, a huge theme for my, my life. Like I think everyone goes through it, but I was like, 
very fixated on this. Um, and mostly it was because I went to a school where I didn't look like a lot of the people that I was going to school with. Um, and that is race wise, size wise, um, social standing wise, or like social economic um, socially, socially and economically, um, in a bunch of different ways. And so I had this like overdrive of trying to fit in for one, but then also trying to stand out. Um, and then also kind of the pressure of being like, um, exceptional in the ways that I was standing out and then feeling like I had to maintain that or feeling like I had to do something in order for that to continue being true about me rather than understanding that that was something that was innate inside of me and that, you know, I was enough already. So I don't think I'm alone in that um, feeling of like not being enough or feeling like you had to do something to be enough. Um, but that was a big part of my story during my adolescence. And then once I got into the workforce, I was working in the nonprofit sector. Um, and I think that like every, every type of work, right, has its challenges, but working in the nonprofit sector is kind of a special place where like you have so much emotional baggage that is connected with the work that you're doing, right? Like more than likely, not everywhere, but like for the most part in the work that I was doing, I was doing domestic violence services and um, food access work, um, really like helping people get their basic needs like safety and food. And um, I did a little work around housing as well. That was maybe not like for a job, but was a professional endeavor. Um, and so not only was I tired, like I was being, I was working long hours and, you know, doing a lot literally. Um, and in some cases, like when doing the stuff with food, I was even like physically exhausted from like moving food. Like we were moving huge. I was running a food hub. Um, so we were, we were literally moving large amounts of food every day. Um, but then there's also the kind of emotional task of like, not only am I doing work that is hard, but I'm doing work that is really, really personal to me um, and really personal to the people that I'm serving. And so there's a lot of emotions kind of high on the radar that are affecting our everyday ability to do the work, whether that's emotions coming from us or emotions that we're dealing with from the community that we're serving. Um, and doing that work in the pandemic was you know, I felt like everyone else was like, oh, I get to stay home and like hang out and not really have as much to do. And it was like, I went into overdrive. I started a new job in April of 2020. <laughs> um, so it was like before we even knew what was going on, I was in the middle of starting a new job doing the same work, but kind of even more, um, even more focused work because not only was I doing food access work, but I was doing um, work helping farmers and uh, agricultural workers um and so at this time where like everyone was kind of like at this high level of stress everyone was kind of realizing how much mental health really is important to be considering and taking care of i was helping people and not really not really paying attention to the fact that i needed to help myself as well um and that led to in 2021 really being burnt out from that work and really having to make a coming to a crossroads and having to make a decision. Am I going to still continue doing the work that I'm doing? Or am I going to do work that forces me to be mentally focused on not only the work, but on caring for myself? Um, and that's how I ended up starting Liminal Grace and shifting from nonprofit work to wellness work um and and like healing work it was because i knew that i could not and i had taught yoga for a while like on and off while i was doing that um and it was like i'd already come to the conclusion that like i can't do this work and help other people learn how to rest and learn how to take care of themselves and learn that they are enough if i don't believe those things and do those things on my own so it was really like almost like my business was my accountability partner. <laughs> um, and that's where I am right now. So, um, but as you can see, like through that story, there's so many different types of rest that were, <laughs> that were not being had um, to, and then coming into this, this era of like me really focusing on rest on a personal and professional level 
has kind of taken me full circle and brought me to this place where um, I'm focused on every type of rest and how I can integrate each one into my life. So speaking of integration, let's go into that. So the first one is physical rest. Um, we talked about it earlier. You know, people often think about this as what rest is because it's sleep um, or like one of the examples of physical rest is sleep. Um, and that's what people, a lot of times people think rest and sleep are the same thing, which is definitely not true. Um, sleep is a wonderful thing. And sometimes when you sleep, you feel rested afterwards. But um, I feel like I'm not the only one. You can use the little like hand raise um, emoji thing if you have it on your Zoom. But can we just have like a raise of hands for anyone who has ever slept but not felt rested afterwards? <laughs> You can either put your hand up if your video is on or just like use the little thingy. Yeah, but we got a, a few people that are like, yes, that's me, been there. Um, and that's because rest is really the ability to feel rested. It's the, um, it's the act of actually feeling that restedness, right? And if you are sleeping, but then still waking up exhausted, the sleep was actually not that restful, right? And there's a lot of reasons that that can happen. Um, it could be that, um, you know, certain things keep our mind going even when we're sleeping. So that can be things like, like caffeine or sugar late in the day. It can be um, something as simple as like being on your phone right before sleep or um, even having like the mental things that are going on in your day-to-day -day life kind of interrupting your ability to sleep. So that could be stressors, that could be um, anxiety about something that's coming up uh, the next day. It can even just be like, um, like just your body feeling stressed, you know what I mean? Like tension that has been held in your body um, through experiences that continues to be held in your body because it hasn't been worked out, you know, just laying down is not necessarily going to always um, work those kinks out. Um, so in addition to sleeping, which is a passive version of physical rest, uh, napping, physical rest. Um, and so that includes things like yoga and stretching, receiving a massage, um, having a bath even. Um, and so all of those that you can, you can actively rest your physical body in a way that is actually more restful than your sleep. Um, so that is physical rest. And mental rest is things like your self-talk. Um, rumination is an example of something that happens that can kind of disturb your mental rest. Um, stress it, stressors or judgment. Um, so those are actually, sorry, not examples. Those are examples of re reasons that you might um, not, you might need mental rest. Um, and so how you can know that you might need some mental rest is if you're irritable, if you are experiencing some of those things like stress, if you're really over judgmental of yourself, if you're ruminating, um, if you're experiencing mental fog, that's a huge one. Um, and one that really, I think, like exploded during the, the beginning of the pandemic is everyone trying to keep up with all the information about COVID-19 and the like mental fog of just like being overwhelmed with information and not really knowing what was right and what was wrong. Um, so that's one, I feel like mental fog and overwhelm are things that kind of exploded in 2020 for most people. Um, even if that was not like part of your story beforehand, it might've become at that point. Um, so those are ways that you can know that you need mental rest and consider ways that you can uh, create some mental rest for yourself is first considering the emotional load of different activities that you're doing. Um, so a lot of times we're doing a lot and we're like multitasking and we're doing a lot as far as like with our brains, right? Like that's why people love coming to meditation or yoga because it kind of gives you an opportunity to like turn off your brain and just be in your body for a little while. And so when you feel like you need that really badly, that means that you need mental rest. Um, that can be meditation or yoga. It can also just be understanding that like, okay, if I do this thing that is very mentally, um, mentally or emotionally taxing, 
I not only need the time that it takes to do that, but I also need time maybe before or after to either prepare myself for the activity by like, you know, resting so that I can be fully alert during the activity, or it can be that I need time afterwards to like rest and, <laughs> and like integrate whatever it was that I just learned or, um, you know, take in the things that I was trying to take in, process the information rather than just taking it in and not really having time to synthesize anything. Um, and I find this is really important when you are a student for one. So as you're learning things, you need time to like let your, your body like fully integrate them into understanding. Um, so sometimes if you have like a long day of like multiple classes or multiple classes and then working or something like that, you can be really mentally exhausted afterwards. Um, I also learned this in my own life as far as teaching. There are days where like I teach maybe three or four classes or sessions um, in one day. And I've realized that like, I really need time in between, not just to do other tasks with the next you know, client, but for me to process everything and for me to kind of rest because, you know, a uh, hour of teaching people yoga or an hour of working one-on-one -on -one with a client or an hour of a mindfulness workshop is a lot different energetic than an hour of, you know, folding clothes in my bedroom. <laughs> the next is sensory rest. So an example of sensory rest can be actually depriving some of your senses. Um, and that can look like closing your eyes or um, they have like sensory deprivation tanks, but I don't think you need to like pay to do one of those things necessarily to experience sensory deprivation. Um, anytime that you're like closing off some of your senses, you are, are doing that. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, also trips to quieter places. So I live in Washington, DC. I don't know where everyone else lives. We can do introductions after this, but um, living in a city, is like after a couple of weeks of being here, I'm like, okay, I gotta get out to Maryland. <laughs> I gotta get out to somewhere with like a bunch of trees and not a bunch of cars. Um, and so one way that you can like kind of realize that you need more sensory rest is feeling especially sensitive to sounds, lights, um, just general bustle, like moving around a lot might become overwhelming. Um, and then just overwhelm in general. Um, if you're feeling really overwhelmed by like the daily tasks of your life, or um, if you live in a city, maybe it's your commute starts to feel really overwhelming and um, you're like stressed and intense by the time you get to your job or to wherever you're going. That could be an, uh, a signifier that you need sensory rest. Um, and what can you do? You can leave the city, which I do on a regular basis. I realize that like as much as I love the convenience of being in a city, um, it's really nice to get out to rural areas where things are moving slower and things are quieter and I can see the stars at night. Um, and that really restores me personally. And I think that's true even if you live in a suburb because um, they're becoming about as bustly as cities at this point. Um, so that's one way also. I just think of like teen me who used to like put on my headphones and like listen to something that was maybe calming or maybe just like pertain to my emotional state at that point and closing my eyes and just kind of having that like I'm in my own world feeling of not having even though I'm still using my sense of um, hearing it's like focused on one thing and everything else is blocked out. My eyes are closed so visually everything is blocked out and I can really feel into my senses of smell and taste and um and touch and so a really big part of yoga and mindfulness is actually sen sensory deprivation or um like closing off some senses to give yourself the ability to experience others at a heightened state which is why like a lot of times with meditation your eyes are closed or there um there's a practice called pratyahara in yoga that is um or that's like one of the eight limbs of yoga but it's also um something that you can practice or like have a practice of in the same way that you can have a practice of getting on your mat and doing yoga poses um and that is really about closing off some of your senses to allow for other ones to be more heightened or giving 
you know, the senses that are always working, which is mostly like our sight and our um, hearing. Uh, a break and <laughs> the other ones you know, take over and become stronger. Next on our list, emotional rest. Um, so emotional rest can look like choosing your your um, environment and your kind of things that you try to engage in more carefully. And you may know that you need emotional rest when you're having feelings of inadequacy or comparison. So this is a huge one that can often come from too much time on social media um, or just the idea of comparing yourself to other people and not realizing that like, because you are you, you have your own lane and your own, um, your own magic that you bring to the world. Um, so anytime that you're feeling like inadequate or you are feeling like not good enough in whatever way it may be, a lot of times that means that you need some emotional rest. Uh, also feelings of anxiety. Anxiety is a huge one for almost all of these types of rest, but especially emotionally, emotional rest, because anxiety is really, I mean, most, and if you have, if you deal with anxiety regularly, you know that it's kind of like a drama, dramatization of whatever you're experiencing. Like anxiety is there for a reason. It keeps us safe. It like warns us of danger and things like that on a very primal level. Um, but also a lot of times right now, it's like things can, our body goes into the anxiety of my life is in danger when really the, the level of danger that we're in is actually a lot different. Um, and so a lot of times that can come from being in an emotional state or can affect your emotional state and create, um, you know, feelings of sadness or feelings of worry or, um, or kind of like doom and gloom feelings, um, even if that is not a proper reflection of what you're going through. Um, and then also feeling like a burden. So a lot of times people have a hard time asking for help because they feel like a burden. And that is a, is a signifier of the need for emotional rest as well. So the first is considering your environment, considering who you're around and what kind of things you're feeding yourself. Um, I always tell people you are what you eat and you're eating more than food. So you're eating the content that you, that you, um, see on social media and on the internet, you're, you're, um, you know, ingesting all of the like belief systems of the people around you. Um, you are like a, an amalgamation kind of of the, the people that you are around the most. Those people definitely influence how you think about life. So if you are around people who um, are either um, very, very negative or very kind of toxic. 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 Yeah. Oh, yes. Toxic. <laughs> Truly toxic people. Um, you know, that is an important a thing to keep an eye on, right? Who am I spending the most time with? Are those people actually making me feel good about life or are they helping me to feel bad about life? Uh, and then also boundaries. A lot of times we are so focused on doing our, on the things outside of ourselves, right? So our relationships with other people, our jobs, our material items that we give the boundaries, like a boundary, or a, love, love, a, a love letter to yourself, right? Your boundaries are like, okay, this is, these are the bounds in which I can feel good about myself, take care of myself, and feel safe. Um, and so when we start to let those boundaries encroach on us and get closer and closer where it's not what we really need, we can really start to be in need of that emotional rest. So setting boundaries and keeping them and learning how to say no to certain things that, you know, even though that person is cool and you might like them, or maybe they had a place in your life in the, in, um, the past, maybe, you know, understanding that maybe they're not out of your life, but maybe they need to um, take up a different space in your life than the one you're with every single day. <laughs> okay. So speaking of our relationships, social rest. Um, so there's two different examples and they're almost the exact opposite. So this is very much um, kind of similar 
centered on whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Um, so if you're an extrovert, maybe spending time with folks who really inspire you and make you feel supported and loved is your example of social rest. Maybe if you're an introvert, having all that time, even if it is with folks who you really care about and love and inspire you, maybe that can be a lot of energy over time and you need time just, just alone by yourself in your own energy, in your own field, right? Not intermingling with anyone else. Um, the other introverts in the room, I'm sure can, <laughs> can relate to literally like almost on an energetic level, feeling other people on you <laughs> and having to like take time to like kind of take them off and, uh, in a spiritual or, um, like, you know, metaphysical sense. Um, and so that is sometimes, you know, sometimes alone time is that social rest is you're resting from being social. Um, times that you might understand that you need social rest are feelings of loneliness, even when you're not alone. So it could be that you're kind of overdoing social things. And even when you're out there doing them, you're kind of just going through the motions at this point. You're not really enjoying or taking anything in positive or negative. I mean, um, positive or constructive from the experience. It could also be the opposite, that you're isolating yourself, that you're um, anxious about being around other people. And it's because you maybe are not having good experiences with being around other people. So you're not around folks who actually inspire you and um, uplift you. Or it could be that, you know, you are learning how to integrate other people into your space. And that sometimes takes a process. Um, another one is self-neglect. And this is one I know very well. I feel like this is the type of social unrest that I experience the most or have experienced the most in my life. Um, I feel like I'm doing better now. But um, <laughs> self-neglect, sometimes you realize that, you know, every person that wants to hang out, every person that needs something, every person that um, invites you to a party, you're saying yes to everyone else and you're not saying yes to yourself. So um, one way to really know that you need maybe a break away from, maybe it's social media, maybe it's um, away from just social events for a couple weeks, um, whatever it may be for you, but it's that feeling of, okay, I'm helping everyone else. I'm doing what everybody else wants me to do, but am I doing what I really need and want? And things that you can do is yeah, take stock of who you're spending time with or how you're spending time with them. And then also a pri prioritizing alone time. And I really, when I say your alone time, I mean time that you're by yourself, but I don't just mean like sitting and watching TV, even though that can be a restful, um, a restful activity and it can be something that is considered social rest. I think it's also important to have time by yourself while, where you are like reflecting on, on your wellness. <laughs> and I think that is a really important type of social rest of taking stock of what you need and what, um, what is important to you or what you're going through or feeling and, um, and using that to understand how you want to walk back out into, you know, social world. All right, creative rest. And this is really just giving yourself time to be creative, right? <laughs> um, that's really what creative rest is. Um, and it's also giving yourself time to be creative without any attachment to outcome. And I think that's a really important detail is the attachment to outcome. So it's not about creating a whole bunch of stuff that you can sell or creating a whole bunch of stuff for a specific project. Um, it's really about using art as your outlet. Um, and ways that you know you might need that is if you do have like a writer's block or creative block of some sort and um, and part of it feels like it's based on like a pressure to perform in a certain way. Um, also it can happen when you're just like kind of bored with life and your things feel dull and uninteresting. And sometimes it's because you need some creative rest. So what you can do to, um, to create more creative rest in your life is prioritizing time doing things that you're not that good at. So something that you like doing. Um, one example of this is I used to live in a group house. It was six of us, um, which, you know, if you live in a big city, you probably know this culture of like a bunch of people living together. Um, and one of the things that was 
part of our house of being part of our house was that we had a house band and no one, I mean, actually one or two people were okay at playing instruments, but none of us were really musicians. <laughs> we were just people who enjoyed music and enjoyed the idea of working together on something as a house. Um, and so we would learn to the best of our abilities, <laughs> um, you know, a couple typically pop songs, things that people could sing along to so that like you couldn't quite hear how terrible we were playing our instruments. But we would do an okay job of playing a whole bunch of songs and then we'd have house parties where we play for all of our friends. And it was the most wonderful version of creative rest I've ever, I'm like trying to recreate it in my life now with my friends. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I don't live there anymore and most of those people don't even live in this country anymore but um it was really a nice time to just like enjoy the process of doing something without the attachment to the outcome of being really good at it or it being becoming something that you know is profitable or all that kind of stuff like so often in our world because capitalism is like the system that we live under we're always trying to figure out how we can commodify our talents and our um our habit i mean our hobbies and things like that and it's really nice to just have a hobby that's just for you that is not necessarily a, even about getting good at it maybe it's just about enjoying the process and so that is definitely a way that you can experience creative rest is just enjoying the process of creating and having that be your focus um, also creating something new. So maybe you are a painter and you want to uh, try your hand at ceramics, you know, like trying something new that just gets you out of your usual space can sometimes kind of unlock or ignite a, um, and a, a different type of creativity within you. And then also using prompts. So um, I have writing or painting prompts, but it can be any type of creative prompt. Um, sometimes that's helpful just to get the juices flowing, to have something to like kind of focus on rather than that open, uh, you know, create whatever you feel like. So there's kind of those two different options of like, okay, focusing on a thing and then trying to like embody or um, represent that thing in your art or having it be a little bit more open-ended than you're used to having it and just kind of, you know, going where the paint leads you. <laughs> Um, and both can be really restoring. And last but not least, spiritual rest. And this can be, a, this is a type of rest every person needs, whether you consider yourself a spiritual person or not. Um, in my opinion, we're like all spiritual people, even if we're not doing a religious or spiritual practice specifically. Um, but it's really about connecting with something greater than yourself in general. So that can be community, or that can be God, or that can be the universe, or that can be any other type of thing that <laughs> spiritually restores you. Um, and reasons that you may need spiritual rest, or you can um, kind of see that you're depleted of spiritual rest, is one, feeling that you don't belong anywhere. So that feeling of like kind of being a lone wolf or... Um, or not even a lone wolf, because I think that might be more of a by choice type of term, but um, of just feeling like you don't fit in anywhere. And then also not feeling like you have a purpose is a big one as well. So when you have lost purpose or lost that feeling of belonging, you know that you need some spiritual rest that can look like prayer or some type of um, specifically religious um, act. Um, which prayer doesn't necessarily have to be specifically religious, but I think it's an example of um, a spiritual and religious practice. Also community involvement. So maybe you're not super spiritual, you're not interested in going to church or, um, you know, joining a sangha or something like that, but you do want to be, um, you know, kind of involved in something. And when I say community involvement, it's not just going to an event, but it's actually like becoming a member of a club of some sort or um, becoming a member of some type of movement that gives you some added purpose and some added, you know, there's people waiting for you <laughs> um, every Wednesday to show up to running club and to run with them because you're all working towards this goal um, of, of running, whether it's a race or whether it's just being in, in running shape. Um, and then the other one is meditation, is that idea of connecting with something greater than yourself, um, whether that is outside of yourself or within yourself. 
Cool. So that was all seven types of rest. Um, and so I have kind of given you my story and maybe you saw some of the different types of rest that were, um, that were present there. Um, and so for the last, maybe for the next like 10 minutes or so, we're just going to do a little guided meditation and journaling exercise. So I'll give you the option. You don't have to write anything down if you're not a journaler, <laughs> but if you are, go grab your journal or a journal app or something like that. Um, and when you come back, we'll just find ourselves in a meditative position with a neutral spine. So try not to be slumped, but also try not to be like overextending your spine, just kind of sitting up straight. Um, and find a position where you are not distracted by the comfort or discomfort of the pose. So if you think that, you know, laying down right now would make you fall asleep within the next five, um, five to 10 minutes, then maybe falling asleep is not something that will um, work for you because you'll become distracted by the comfort of it. Um, at the same time, I don't want you to try to sit in lotus pose if that's not what your body can do right now, because the discomfort of that is going to definitely distract you from the 10 minute meditation. <laughs> so I'll give you a second to get yourself together. Um, and I'm also going to take off the screen share for right now. Maybe I already have. Okay, great. Um, all right. So when you're ready, you can soften your gaze or close your eyes, whichever one feels better to you. And we're going to start out with a couple shoulder rolls just to kind of get us all in a little bit more of internalized space. Do we want our cameras on, Gigi, for this? Um, you it's could. private moment. Yeah. Okay. It's up to y'all. I don't need to necessarily see you. I won't be doing anything too strenuous. But I would love to see your smiling faces or your meditating faces. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll do this. We'll stay on. <laughs> cool. So once you find your seat, take a moment to just notice your body. Notice how you're feeling in your legs, in your feet. Notice how your shoulders feel. Notice your jaw, your eyes, your face, your forehead. And on an inhale, reach your shoulders up towards your ears. Exhale, roll them back and down. Two more of those. Inhaling the shoulders up to your ears. Exhaling all the way back and down. Good. Last one. Inhale up. And exhale back and down. Wonderful. And then use that motion uh, married with our breath to kind of introduce us to witnessing our breath, noticing your inhale and your exhale, noticing the quality of your breath right now. Does it feel smooth or a little shaky? Does it feel full or shallow? Does it feel easeful or forced? No bad answers, right? We're not judging, we're not analyzing the why right now. We're just noticing what is. And that'll be our headspace for all of this meditation is even as we are reflecting on our relationship with different types of rest, I don't want you to judge yourself. I don't want you to um, try to go into too far of an analysis even right now. Right now is really just about observing ourselves of 
having that experience of being the observer and the observed at the same time. Good. Regardless of how your breath is right now, we're going to start to deepen the breath a little bit, pulling the breath all the way down into the navel, letting the stomach kind of puff out a little bit, and then exhaling, pulling that belly button to spine, noticing as the body kind of hugs back towards itself. And if at any point during this, we talk about a certain type of rest that you're having a really stressed or frustrating relationship with, I want you to take a deep breath and first just notice the expansiveness of your body, feel the nourishment of the breath. And then as you exhale, feel your body hug back towards itself and almost feel it as a spiritual hug from yourself to yourself. You can even wrap your arms around if that is necessary or feels good. And just know that breath is always there for you. It's your anchor. It's your support. It's your safety blanket. Good. And then first, we're going to come to physical rest. This is the rest that either passively or actively focuses on our physical body, on how we feel, on our senses. Notice within your own self in this moment and within your life, you know, more, more recently we'll think about like maybe the last year or two. Ask yourself, what is your relationship with physical rest? Do you get a full eight hours of sleep and feel rested after them? The suggested sleep time for adults is seven to nine hours. So do you feel like you get those seven to nine hours and do you actually feel rested after or not? Are you able to take naps when you have the time and the need for them? Or is it difficult for you? Do you do other practices that are more active that help your body feel restored? Maybe like yin yoga or restorative yoga, stretching, getting massages or going to a spa or just taking a bath with Epsom salt. Or maybe something else that you do that restores your body. And if you have chosen a journal, feel free to just use whatever, um, use this time to write down some notes about each one for yourself. The next one. Are you frozen? One is mental rest. Ooh, relate to mental rest, experience mental rest. Is my sound doing okay, Alpha? You kind of cut off a minute, minute. Okay. Okay, but we can hear better now? Yes. Wonderful. So yeah, we're on mental rest right now. So taking some time to notice how do you relate to the idea of resting mentally, of letting whatever you're worried about or anxious about go for a little bit or creating boundaries. Meditating. 
And then I want to ask about rumination. Rumination is the activity of kind of going something, going over something in your head time and time again. Maybe it's a conversation that you had with someone that you wish you had said something different, or maybe it's um, preparing for a conversation with someone and <laughs> going over what you're going to say in your head over and over again to the point where it seems like you can't let go of it. That can be so mentally exhausting. You can continue writing about any of them. I'm just gonna move on to the next one for timing's sake. The next one is sensory rest. Do you ever take time to just rest your senses? How does your environment change your, um, your relationship with sensory rest? Are you in a city that's very loud? Thank you. I'm going to share some of the stuff in the um, chat once I'm done this. Good. So he did sensory rest. The next one is emotional rest. So are there ways that you can set boundaries or change your environment in some way so that you feel emotionally restored, that you have time to process and understand your emotions. Do you ever feel like you are kind of almost swept up in your emotions rather than your emotions being something separate from you that you have control over? Do you ever feel like they're unmanageable or overwhelming? That could be a, a sign that you need emotional rest. Meditation is a good one for this one too. I mean, I, maybe I'm biased because I teach meditation, but <laughs> it's a good one for this also, just because of that idea of separating yourself, that non-attachment to your emotions is a really great skill, a great coping mechanism to stop yourself from being emotionally depleted. Next, what is your relationship with social rest? Do you ever feel like you're socializing too much or socializing not enough? How does that affect your relationship with yourself, with your ability to feel rested? Are you giving yourself the same care that you're giving your social circles and your family and your coworkers or clients. Next is creative rest. And I know I'm going a little bit over y'all. That's fine. Next, okay. Creative rest, um, are you giving yourself creative outlets that are not attached to an outcome? And do you find that the idea of that to be challenging or does that come very easily for you? Are you able to find the art in all of the things that happen in your life? Do you walk outside and things feel vibrant and bright or do things feel a little dull for you lately?
And then speaking of zest for life, we come to our last one, spiritual rest. Do you feel connected with something greater than yourself? Whether that is um, just the connectedness of all human life, we're all living beings, or whether that is connection to God or creator, spirit, universe, whatever word you um, connect with that idea. And maybe reflect on some ways that you choose to connect with something greater than yourself. Are you someone who prays regularly? Are you someone who attends a church or, um, or a sangha or um, a meeting for worship or some other type of spiritual group, a women's circle? Or maybe your spiritual rest comes from meditation, from time alone. Beautiful. And I'll just allow for a little bit more time for you to catch up on any of the the types. <laughs> And once you have come to a close, whether it's right now with me or later, I just want you to take one cleansing breath to kind of finish off your reflection time on all the different types of rest. And a cleansing breath is when you sit up tall and you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe you do that little sigh that I told you all about from my mama. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> so <laughs> I suggest it if you're interested, but you can take a deep inhale through the nose, really fill up the whole torso and let it out through the mouth, maybe with a sigh, <sighs> relaxing the shoulders, slinking the eyes open if they're closed. Well, thank you all for joining me. Um, I'd love to hear back from folks of their experience of either the information or the meditation slash journal prompting. So question, um, and it's not a question, but kind of going over some like these um, creative blocks that you talked about. Um, I mean, it's really interesting. I was going through all of these and, and making little notes about, man, how much rest do we need every day? <laughs> and then how, um, I don't know, since the summer when I first met you, I started, um, I'm gonna change this view to gallery. Um, when I first met you and still needing to, you know, I'm just like, my energy is like all, over, not all over the place, but it's a lot going on when we did the retreat in, um, in Juniper's garden. And I just couldn't sit still, you know, so there's another exercise that you talked about in terms of being disengaging oneself to even get ready for um, the rest. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's like, you know, um, I, I think you, you didn't go over that, but like even getting ready, it just doesn't come all at once, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I expect it to come all at once. Yes, that is such an important thing. Um, and something that I really, I teach a lot in, especially when I'm doing meditation is that, um, in yoga, we talk about the balance of effort and ease, right? And so in our 
current world, there's a lot of push on effort and we don't always get the ease part, which is why that's kind of what I focus on, but both are important, both are necessary. Um, we also can't sit around all day and not ever do anything that wouldn't be good for us either. So um, as far as learning how to be still, sometimes it takes a little bit of preparation of the body and mind to do that. Um, so for one thing, like when you are meditating, a lot of people have a really hard time sitting still um and often that is because i mean if you're doing a seated meditation sometimes that could be that you like need some strengthening which is so funny because i feel like people don't think that you need to be strong to sit up but if you're going to sit up straight for a certain amount of time <laughs> for like 20 minutes while you're doing a meditation like there's some strength that is um necessary for that that we don't always have if we're always leaning on something um but I like to do a little like stretching and um, kind of like warming up before I do meditation. So I actually share that um, practice. I have it on my Patreon right now. I think I might have like a mini version of it on Instagram, but I have like a more in-depth um, explanation of like my usual meditation warm up. Um, but then there's also like the mental preparation for for stillness of kind of knowing that the first time you do it, it's not necessarily just going to be like, oh, I'm so Zen <laughs> and I'm like completely silent. Like often the, the practice of meditation is really you being distracted over and over again and you continuing to return to that, um, to that focus, whether that is your breath in this meditation or whether that is just the present moment, um, whether that is coming out of a of a mindset of like judgment or comparison and you know coming back to just like an open awareness of yourself um it can look a lot of different ways but the expectation of just going into meditation and all of a sudden being like a buddhist monk overnight it's just not <laughs> it's not it's not the goal even you know what i mean like not only is it not um very uh you know not as, is it not reality, but it's also just like, it's not necessary. <laughs> um, the act of meditation or of presence is really the act of returning when you realize that you got away from it. Thanks for sharing Alpha. Yes, um, I will definitely share my contact info. You said community, um, like I, I did put in the chat, I live, here on a major thoroughfare between two highways. One is um, the 57 and, and the other is um, the Sabo um, Lakeshore Drive. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of trucks that come through all times of the day, all times of the night. And it's like, I, my bedroom window is right there, literally four bay windows that literally <laughs> absorb all that sound you know that come down that high it's never ending um well i live in an urban environment and i know i do take out time to go to lake michigan you know so i can you know meditate near the water or think through the water and try and find uh, you know that kind of space but literally um there's no there's there's no disconnect um from those external sounds of the city, um, you know, and I know that they're always in the back of my head and I don't really get a sound sleep no matter what, because those external sounds are, are behind you. Um, and I think the most restful sleep that I had this whole year is when I was in um, Brandywine and I was <laughs> there at the, <laughs> at the river keepers because you know it's like pitch dark and there's no sound and nothing happening and then when I was there <clears throat> in Juniper's garden you know and I my space was away from all everyone's basically it wasn't like a neighborhood walk it was over the other side so that I could find calm um, and those are the times that I I know that I do the environmental installation and the environmental installation even though we had a gallery opening that Friday as artists, I do that kind of work to separate myself from these deadlines um, mm. and, and kind of dig in to nature, dig into the soil, dig into the grass 
that's around the trees that's around, you know, and then, uh, and then it's meditative, you know, creating these ceremonies around the work. And, and it's not with intent, but I am intentional when I do that. But I know that, that when I can peel away and, and people say, what are you talking about? You're out there wrapping trees. You know what I mean? They couldn't, con the concept wasn't there, you know, for most people in the arts, when you start talking about you're doing environmental projects and what you're doing. So I'm just only sharing ways that I um, come away from the canvas and being here in the studio and being in the urban environment um, and, and step away from project management. You know how I'm doing all this project managing California here and in Illinois, in Chicago. And then to, and so it was rewarding but it was another way that I had to really mentally disengage from the work that I do to be able even to get into that space, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know Carol, the other curator, had a problem with it because I was still on the phone. I was still talking. I was still having conversations with all that planning. And I was supposed to be, and it never was a retreat because it was a lot of work involved. And you know that as well because we were wearing all these hats of project management and being the artist, da, 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 da. Yes. But at the time, we were in a space, you know, that nurtured what our needs were, you know. Um, and I'm just talking about in terms of like this creative block and the need to, you know, um, get back within into nature, um, finding these, or in the urban environment and finding these spaces that are now community spaces, community garden spaces, where they're in, in Chicago has beautiful, beautiful, some of the most beautiful uh, parks, you know, in in the nation, as far as I'm concerned, because they're 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 just beautiful and along the shore. But there's places in the urban environment we can go to center ourselves, you know, uh, away from the chaos. Uh, and I just think we employ ourselves to really find those spaces, you know, to to break away from all this uh, cultural work that we do, you know, because I'm not going to find any rest. You know, I try to rest and get a book, you know what I mean? And my and, and the books gives me, as I think abstractly <laughs> and I work and paint abstractly, you know, like and, you know, I'm a conceptual thinker. So when I get a book or even if I have the TV on, you know, it blocks out the other noise and makes me center in and not have all those conversations in my head with all the people that I'm always working with and working for and thinking and developing their stuff. You know, I, I've just found a place to zero in, but I sitting there trying to meditate is not going to happen right now. Right. But I think eventually I will be like, um, like you said, at a, at a space where I can, um, you know, um, what did you call it? I'm looking for the term you used. Um, learn how to ease into it. Mm. Yeah, and what you find is that easing into something is not always easy. <laughs> no, you said the balance of effort and ease, mm -hmm. you know, and learning how to do that, so. You know, yeah. it's just, yeah, so. That's beautiful. And I love that you have really committed yourself to that work. Like this summer, I mean, we talked about it, but it's, you know, there, there's times where it's like, you're in a space of like, ooh, this is something I need. And it's not always, it's exciting then. And then it's like hard to actually commit to it once you get back to your regular life. But I've really seen that you've been doing that over time. So kudos to you. Bye. And, um, um, you know, I don't know, Aisha, are you going to make a comment about today? You're on mute. Can't hear you. Oh, uh, actually, you're not on mute, but I can't hear you. Maybe turn on mute and then turn it back off. She's unmuted. I don't know where the volume is. Hmm. The problem's on, on her end. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh. 
just the best rate. Oh. Well, so, we can give you a moment to look at it if anyone else has something to say, <laughs> and then maybe you can come back. Okay. I like this notion of love letter to yourself too, mm. you know, and um, sometimes, you know, like, you know, when we take out the time, like you said, to journal and to write, do we, you know, we, as, I don't know, for me as a caregiver, you know, or being the matriarch of my family, it's always this, um, you know, you love so much in other people and in your family and your, you know, your kids, you know, and your young adults and the grandkids. So you, you were always giving, 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 you know, and um, I think it is important to sit down and write a love letter to yourself and what that looks like and, and how to frame that, you know, because um, we can write love letters to other people mm -hmm. and write one to ourselves and embrace our, our own selves, you know, in, in this in this work that we do. Um, yeah. Is Asia? And, uh, yes, can you know? Oh yeah. Can Are you ready? I yeah. Can hear you I have some <laughs> headphones, and I don't know what the issue is with my laptop. Um, I was gonna say I'm feeling like a little bit of what Alpha was saying, but the opposite. So, um, I think it was like 2012. I went through like that whole "what's the purpose of life" issues. Felt really depressed. And I started doing art therapy and art journaling, which helped tremendously. Um, but recently I moved back to the city. So for the past maybe six or seven years, I was living in a very small town, very quiet town, had nice relaxing pool in my backyard. I feel like mm -hmm. I need connection with water a lot, especially for sensory overload and things like that. I like to have it quiet. Um, now the problem I'm having is just feeling disconnected from everything else. It's like, I want to get involved in art and I want to get involved in the community, but living so far, it becomes stressful to get to the city. Um, so you mentioned being in DC and um, visiting Maryland. I'm actually going to be moving there probably 2024. And that's the issue I'm having now is do I live in Maryland and visit DC or do I live in DC and visit Maryland for the rest? Um, because I'm so used to having the remote living and the quiet pace and the slow pace that when I jump into the city, it's almost like a cultural, uh, almost like a sensory overload. Um, and even I lived in LA for a while and I was there for a couple of months and I was like, I can't live in the city. This is, I never felt rested. I always felt tired even like now I'm wrapping up my last semester of school, like depending on caffeine, I'll sleep and wake up feeling tired. Um, so I'm actually having the opposite is like the rest is good, but it's hard for me when I come to the city. So I'm trying to figure out what's that good balance. And the fact that you have a yoga practice, I think is really good because I'm like, in a perfect scenario, I would wake up and stretch and pray and do yoga in the morning. And I look at my alarm clock and I'm just like, no, not today. But it's every morning. I'm like, mm, I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> um, but I could really resonate with your story. I think that as women, we do carry a lot of that do for others. And I find that, um, so my age growing up, there was no self-care. That wasn't a thing. My mom didn't teach me self-care. So as I'm getting older, I find that the things I'm learning, I'm having to teach my mother self-care is mom, you need to take a break. You need to take time. Don't do for everyone else. And that's foreign to her. And that's not how she raised me. She was like, always do for others and do for your kids and do for your older parents and do for your husband. And now it's like with the generation of time people look at me as selfish, but they also see that I'm happier. And they're like, what did you do? And I'm like, I stopped doing for everybody else and started balancing doing for myself with everybody else. Instead of giving myself the leftovers, I kind of have kind of sort of given everybody else leftovers. It's like me first and then whatever time I have left over is for everything and everyone else to try and create that balance. Um, 
but it is very difficult to do. It's not, it's easier said than done. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Wow, there's so much there. First off, um, the whole like, they say like when you heal yourself, you heal all the generations before you. And I feel like rest and self-care is a, is a part of healing that has, I've really seen that in my life as well, where it's like, okay, I'm doing it for myself. And now I'm like talking to my mother and my aunts and my grandmother and my grandfather about how they can like take care of themselves better. Um, and I actually did like a, um, like a spa day event that was like kind of like a mini retreat. And it was so cool because it was like maybe a good three generations of people, um, of women, came to that spa day. And it was so interesting to like the difference between like there were some like Generation Z, maybe like early, like, you know, like the young millennials, um, and then like more like millennials, Gen X, and then even a few like boomers um, or whatever that, <laughs> yeah, I guess that is what it's called, boomers. <laughs> um, and so there was like a really big array, I think, of um, of people coming to that space, but they were coming to it in such different ways. It was like, some of them were like, oh yeah, self-care is like my thing. And like, I really love, like they, they had been to the spa before and they were like, you know, telling people where to go. And then there were like some um, women who were older and were like, I was never taught how to do this. Like the only people who can teach me how to do this is people who are younger than me because <laughs> this was not pressed. Like, even though there might've been ways that we did it or like, like even now I, I start to um, identify things that like my, I watched my grandma do or my mom do that actually was self-care, but that's not what they called it. <laughs> and they might've only done it when they absolutely needed to, or um, it felt like more of a style thing. Like my grandmother is really big on texture and she has what she calls her soft stuff, which is her pajamas, her around the, around the house stuff. Um, but it's all silky and soft. And like, I remember when I was little, like one of her old ones became one of my blankets or actually it was my mom, one of her old um, like nightgowns became one of my blankets cause I was so in love with it when every time she would wear it. And it's like, okay, that was, you, you, you don't, it might not look like a, you know, some expensive wellness retreat or whatever, <laughs> but it is like, it's a, it's a small form of self-care. Um, and so sometimes when you're able to like pick out those little things that you are doing, but you just didn't realize were really self-care, um, sometimes that can be empowering for you or for someone else that you, you know, point that out in their life of like, oh, I do know how to do this. Like it's, it, it starts to feel less foreign the more you, um, you know, kind of find those little bits of self-care in your existing life. So I just it really enjoyed that you said that about like the generational thing, because that is um, part of it. Like that's something that no one in my family up until now ever thought about. It was always sacrifice what you want your joys for taking care of your family or, <laughs> you know, doing something for your job or whatever it may be. And I'm like the first person in my lineage who's like, I'm going to take the pay cut and do the thing that I really like doing and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and they're like, girl, what? <laughs> so it's been, it's been good. I'm seeing that go the opposite direction. Um, you know, with, with myself and I'm looking at my daughter um, and, and the work that she's doing in the therapeutic field and the migraines that she's getting by taking on everybody else's narrative or everybody else's stuff, you know? So, and I, I use that toxic and, and for um, her and her practice, um, you know, trying to resolve their issues and get them on a plan. But a lot of times as those, um, bear, when you bear all of that, where do you take it to? I mean, how do you, you know, you take it from inside of you internalizing it um, and take it, I took it, put it on the altar. You know, you take it out of yourself, you know, and pray it out of yourself. And so you're not holding on to that. Um, I, I am still wound up like a rubber band, but I was even worse, you know, when I was her age and she's like 36, <laughs> but I was so wound up trying to do this cultural work and raise a family and do all these things you know, um, but I still had to recognize um, that I needed to take all of that and take it somewhere and not have it all in inside of me. 
you know, especially when I'm working with people and they're erratic, um, working with artists and we can go there and we can be erratic, people can be erratic. And then they see your shine or they see your spiritual energy and they drain you of it. You know what I mean? And you have to go somewhere and charge back up, you know, so that you can have the energy to do this, this work, you know, and continue to have this shine. Um, but I see that whole, all that grind, you know, you got to grind. I, I see that happening with, you know, this generation that inherited all of our stuff, you know, and what they're doing, you know, um, she doesn't know I visit her. She probably just have a fit if she hear me talking about her on this 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 public platform. But I do want to have a conversation to see where she's taking all of that and where she places it. You know what I mean? You know, um, and you have to have like a, you know, a, a place. I forget the name of it, but you have to take that 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 all that stuff you know, that you're bringing in the therapeutic world, art therapy, or even with the yoga and you're taking on other people's energy, but you got to have a place to take it to and discard it or leave it so that you can, you know, be ready for the next, you know, and work yourself as a conduit, you know, a, a connector. And so even folks that are doing that spiritual work have a place that they have to take it to, you know, and get it off of them or shake it off of them, you know. Um, I, I see folks in the church when they're laying on hands and they're blessing, I know that they have to take it, you know, and, and, and get it off of, of them, you know, or it comes into your, in your spirit. Um, so I'm really glad you have that as one of the, um, you know, topics that you talked about today. Um, you know, um, and, and that, that opens up the door for another convert, even another conversation by, um, that we can invite another speaker to, to talk to um, us about Kanganese and that type of worship. We had Yaya on board earlier, and she is a medicine woman there in Sacramento. Uh, she's also a curator, uh, and she was listening in, um, you know, earlier. So she may be a person who'll come back and help talk about, you know, those places, you know, and spaces that we create, you know, for ourselves, our, our altars. Um, you know, um, I'm going to segue really quick because I know that we're um, we're always about time. It's only 2.30, basically. Um, this year, the um, we've invited, I've been invited to be part of the City of Altars. Um, and it's a huge celebration that's happening in um, the Capital uh, Region, um, Sacramento, uh, Yolo County. Uh, Solano, you know, um, those those counties where all of these groups are coming together to talk about the um, city of altars. You know, um, this kicks off in um, October, but four, five groups have been charged with building altars and places of prayer. You know, um, not worship, but the events there around like Day of the Dead, um, going all the way into Kwanzaa. And it's a program that um, is being put on by the Latino Center of Arts and Culture, uh, partnering with Sojourner Truth Museum um, and Soul Collective in the Washington Neighborhood Center in Tana. And the goal is to partner um, with these organizations and explore social justice issues affecting our communities while passing on the sacred art of altar making. Um, and we're in these installations that we're gonna do during these altars. We're gonna dig um, a little deeper in ceremonies and having workshops around altar making so that we pass this art form on continually. And um, so it's, it's, it's been a really good invite. And I think that everyone on, these, uh, on our steering committee or cohorts are taking time to cleanse, you know, and in our conversations, I did introduce um, them about the art of rest and the work that we're doing here at Pop-Up Research Station. Um, so we're sending them invitations, um, you know, to talk about this type of cultural work and altar making and sacred arts. Um, we're also looking at um, having in December, um, 
ancestral altars and Kwanzaa tables. And that's part of the installation work that um, I'm doing um, within myself and is contributing to this project. Um, here are the events that are coming up and that we'll share with everyone um, on the 19th that, you know, it's an in-person meeting, um, Souls of the City with uh, Soul Collective and the De Los De Moldros with the um, Tana. And um, in November, Latino Arts Center um, is having their cultural program. And then in December, um, we're having our Kwanzaa Festival of Life, Community, and Culture. And there's a lot of other ceremonies that are going on around Kwanzaa. And Nia, the last day of Kwanzaa, we're having a pause portal. Um, and I talked to them about the work that you have done, Gigi. And then we're looking at the whole pause portal and how in the... Um, Latino community, um, there's also a portal during that time. So they're gonna begin with a portal and the portal is between the living and the dead when it's open during this period of time. And then oh, we're doing the pause portal to end the um, altar uh, making in the city of altars. Um, you know, so that's some of the, the things that we're doing. And like you said, building these building, having these building blocks. And, and I think having you on talking to us and presenting so that we can start centering ourselves and taking care of ourselves, doing this um, cultural work, you know, and, and, and this, these are things that we can pass on, you know, even to the committee uh, cohorts that have come together to put this city of altars, you know, together. You're, uh, um, there you go. That sounds awesome, first off. I wish I was closer to Sacramento so I could come visit. <laughs> um, I'll, where, where is there more information about it, um, Alpha? Or is it possible to put a link in the? I did, I put a link earlier in the chat. It's with the Visual Art Development Project. I, I, I'll put it in there again. Um, that's with the Phantom Gallery. I'll put in with the Visual Arts Development Project. I kind of updated it over there. Oh, I see. Um, um, but um, in saying that to say that I am going to encourage and ask, they want not only a local view, you know, of the region, but also looking at the national impact of the work that we're doing. So I was inviting others, you know, through our asking them and encouraging them to do a um, hybrid you know, so that some of the work is being recorded or some of the conversations are being recorded. Um, they have, they're having a um, videographer come out and record stories uh, of each of the organizations and the artists that are participating. Um, so you will be um, invited to talk about that, the pause portal so that I can share that as part of the documentation. It's where I'm going with the conversation. So, um, you know, again, you know, that pa the pause portal was very impactful, you know, in what you presented um, this summer. And um, so I've included it in on, on that City of Altars, um, you know, project. So we, yeah. we're going to have someone, um, you know, do your prototype that you built and had installed uh, on I... the land uh, and have an indoor installation that is more portable, that can be deconstructed mm -hmm. uh, within the museum setting. So, and then Yaya will be the, um, and her name is uh, Andrea for us. And she will be the one that will to be the workshop leader and facilitate that as a master altar maker. Beautiful. I'm gonna figure out a way to be there. <laughs> I don't know how, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'll, I'll call you, maybe, I'll, maybe we'll uh, road trip across. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I'm planning on flying out there, of course, um, you know, to, in December, because I'm, I'm uh, one of the, uh, well, one of the artists that are presenting, and we're looking at presenting myself, myself and Shauna McDaniels, we're looking at um, mm -hmm. uh, what not shelves, and what that means mm -hmm. in the African American, you know, folk, you know, not even folk, 
you know, community, but the African-American community and how not only, I don't, how we use the um, whatnot shelves as places of altars, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the play, and the things that we collect and what we put on those altars. So we're going to build one and have a conversation about that you know, uh, as the um, Kwanzaa table and as inviting other artists um, by doing a call for artists to present a, um, you know, altars. Mm -hmm. So that's some stuff that's, that's coming up where we're taking and, and continuing to use this practice, you know, in uh, the broader context of, of, of my practice. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So is there any other um, comments or, um, you know, any other comments about your presentation and what's next? What are we gonna do next month? Sure, yeah. Um, first, I just wanna hold space. Was there anyone else that wanted to say something about their experience before I go into? What's next? Okay. Um, if something comes up, you're welcome to throw it in the chat or. Um, okay, I did put my contact info in the chat. So um, I can put it in again, though. I've had a hard time keeping up with the chat, so. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. <laughs> um, but first I wanna say outside of this, I'm doing some other, um, I guess like rest related work. Um, and it kind of pertains, like it's kind of inspiring what the next section session is about because it's going into a little bit of like daydreaming and imagination work um, and how exhaustion affects our ability to imagine and how rest restores that and how rest can be very revolutionary in that way because it gives us the ability to take stock of where we are and um and think a little bit about where we want to be um and that's really like the and i'll go into more depth uh when you again but that's actually where the name of my business liminal grace comes from um it was shortly after me learning the idea of a liminal space, I was like, this is the terminology I've been looking for forever. <laughs> like, it was just like everything clicked together. Um, and so liminal grace is a play off of the term liminal space. Um, and it was really this realization that like, we are always in the present moment. And so we are always in this moment of power, really, where we can look at what has happened in the past and we can dictate what happens in the future. Um, and when you realize like how powerful the present moment is, you give a little bit more attention to it, you give more of your awareness to it and giving that attention and awareness to the present moment, it like widens that liminal space um, or it expands it. It, um, it gives us a little bit more to look at, right? It's like that idea of like being the observer and being the one being observed. Um, it like creates a spaciousness where we can really intentionally navigate that space in a way that creates the future that we want to have. Um, and so that's what I, that's what I am hoping to do like in an overall sense, but that's also what I want to talk about next month is how we can kind of widen that space of the present moment and give ourselves a, um, a space of creation of imagination and, um, and kind of the why and how and what of um, how imagination really requires that spaciousness. And imagination is a, um, you know, if you think about like the elements, like imagination is ether, it's not even air, it's like something kind of, it's a space that everything else exists within. Um, and yeah, we're gonna talk about how rest relates to that and how that um, can influence how we create or what we create or if we create at all. Um, oh, and I did wanna just, um, ah, thank you. 
Yeah, I want to read that out loud, actually. So um, this definition of liminal, uh, a position at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold relating to transitional or in initial uh, initial stage of a process. Exactly. So it's like that in between that um, that kind of initiation, <laughs> right? You're like not, you're no longer a kid, but you're no, not quite yet. Uh, like that, that old, does anybody remember that Britney Spears song? I'm not a girl, but I'm not yet a woman. Like it's very that, right? That's the space that we're in. Um, but even when we are full grown women, cause I think everyone on here is, um, you know, it's that space between like the pattern I've been in and me getting to the pattern I want to be at. There's like this space in between that's like, okay, what am I going to do right now that gets me to the place that I'm trying to go? Um, and I always reference this quote from Tracy Ellis Ross, where she was like, um, I'm trying to remember the exact wording, but it's kind of like, I'm, I'm starting to learn how to let the space between where I am and where I want to be inspire me rather than like intimidate me or something like that. That's basically, so she's like, there's this space between where I am and where I want to be. And I want to feel inspired in that space, not intimidated or fearful. Um, and that's really the grace piece is that inspiration, that like that feeling of divinity in that moment of power rather than um, this kind of anxious panic of crap. I, I, I know where I want to go, but I don't know how to get there. <laughs> um, and that's because I think so many people have that exact feeling, right? Like I've had so many points in my life where I've been like, okay, I know where I'm supposed to be going or where I want to go. I have no idea how I get from what I am right now to that. <laughs> um, and so in some ways I have become that thing that I never thought I could become, or I have done that thing that I never thought I could do. And I'm kind of going back and collecting the breadcrumbs and trying to, um, trying to make sense of it so that I can help the next person or help the future me. Yes. Exactly. A lot of imposter syndrome. Whew. And you know, it's funny, I'm learning that like imposter syndrome, it's kind of like always there waiting for you to fall into it, right? Like, I feel like no matter how accomplished I've been in <laughs> the work that I do, there's still like the opportunity for me to fall into imposter syndrome if I don't, if I'm not careful. <laughs> um, I think of it as like a ditch in the, in the, landscape or something it's like don't fall into that hole over there um but yeah that's important <laughs> yes congratulations on being almost done though a lot of people don't even get to almost done so that's beautiful uh, i see Wonderful. So um, before we finish, I'm just going to share my contact information verbally, um, just in case you cannot get to the chat or for those who are watching this afterwards. So I can be found on Instagram as liminal.grace. So that's L-I-M as in Mary, I-N as in Nancy, A-L dot grace. And my email is gg at liminalgrace.com. My website is liminalgrace.com. Um, although right now it's under construction, but that should be, as long as I don't procrastinate anymore, that should be not true in about a week. Um, <laughs> I am also on Patreon and Patreon is a place where I'm starting to put a lot more of my um, content and my just efforts in general. I'm doing a lot of larger content that is too big for Instagram there. So live stream classes, um, pre-recorded yoga classes and guided meditations, um, conversations about yoga philosophy, which yoga is really just like a science of life. So um, I, it's life philosophy really, or like different things about life. 
Um, and it's, you don't have to be into yoga, honestly, at all to enjoy those conversations. Um, and then what else? And then just like some other little tidbits and little bits, like I'm doing a cleanse for the changing of seasons. I do a lot of work also around seasonality and living with the seasons. Um, and so I'm doing a cleanse for this, like switch from summer to fall. And so I'll be not necessarily guiding anyone else to do a cleanse because that is, I'm not quite there yet, <laughs> but I am going to be sharing my experience of it and, um, answering questions that people have. So Patreon is patreon.com slash liminal grace. Pretty much other than Instagram being liminal.grace, everything is liminal grace. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, I always tell people you could, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me. Um, so I'm definitely grateful. And if you have any other things you wanna share, if you wanna stay connected, feel free to reach out to me via DMs or email or whatever. Cool. If I'm quiet, it's because I'm over here making sure that we get all of the contact information. <clears throat> Um, in the meeting chat. So, and we are Facebook Live today, um, we, uh, mm -hmm. sending out our, um, you know, presentation um, on Facebook Live. I put in the um, chat the Visual Art Development Project and the um, information you asked me for regarding the um, City of Altars. And um, so that's over there. Also, um, um, our Instagram will pop up research station. You can visit that and um, our next workshop, October 17th. And that way we can um, invite uh, other cultural workers that will are interested in trying to recharge and listening uh, in on our conversation and adding to the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'm serious. Now I got to put go to Sacramento on my vision board and figure out how I'm going to make it work schedule wise, because <laughs> I really want to be there. It sounds amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are uh, that are going on. Um, that project is um, um, through the California Arts Council Creative Corps. And, um, you know, it, um, it's funding artists to be part of the creative economy. Um, there's also creative um, core down in Long Beach, our other um, uh, network partner, and um, is where we're going to present next August with Oasis in the Woods. Um, and I talked to everyone about it when we were in uh, Juniper's Garden that a uh, summer of 2024, we're scheduled to do the actual indoor installation of our outdoor space you know mm -hmm. so it doesn't kind of the work we were doing there didn't stop just because okay bye everybody we'll see you next year it, it's a right. you know we're gonna move it all the documentation um that went out on the project um we had a photographer that came and took excellent photographs you know that we can publish um, and I met with the curators and owners of Border Gallery um, when I did my site visits um, in August to kind of look at the space and look at where we are, kind of kind of vision out how we would do the installation, and and also with again the port a pause portal, and to find someone to reconstruct it for it to be a temporary installation in California. And I guess that was your like your vision, you, and I would like for you, you know, to be a part of that, you know, to come out, but if not, you know, that's the end of the year during, you know, Kwanzaa. Um, so you may not be able to leave DC. I know I try to schedule my time and leave out of here when it's snowing and it's cold <laughs> and try to get to the West Coast, you know, I'm a, one of those uh, snowbirds. Um, if I'm yeah. not going down to Georgia or um, Florida, um, you know, I try to get out to California and I will say, I don't know how the hurricane has impacted DC. Um, I don't know, um, what's the state of the East coast right now? Um, has it hit where you are at all? 
No, um, DC has been okay. We've had a couple pretty bad storms, but we didn't get like the thick of it in DC, um, which is great. There were a couple days though where like some trees fell and things like that, but it wasn't anything as major as I think what's been happening in other places. Yeah, and I think we all should be, when as I talk in the other meetings and the intergenerational approach to, to talking, we did mention that sometimes we start these conversations by honoring, you know, people that have, artists that have passed, um, looking at, you know, even our transmission today, there was problems, you know, with, I'm having problems with my phone. I'm just here in Chicago from whatever's happening in the, you know, atmosphere, you know, um, whatever the storm fronts are coming through, whatever's going on, it's always impactful and it impacts how we communicate. Um, I'm plugged directly into the wall so that my Wi-Fi is not interrupted as we're, we're having these meetings. But I know that people can't say my phones are not working, you know, and, uh, you know, someone just left here from um, and went back over to New York and was talking about the disruption in the storms that are happening on the East Coast and then the other hurricanes that are coming through. Um, you know, so we can always talk about that. There's so many, um, you know, we listen to the news and we get overwhelmed with um, the state of the, you know, the environmental justice and the, and the things that are going on uh, worldwide with the what's happening with, with the earth and how can 12,000 plus people just be wiped out, <clears throat> you know, in a flood, you know, and, and how impactful that is and, you know, um, and how many lives can be burned you know, by a lightning strike and and what caused everything to happen, you know, um, uh, with the island uh, Maui burning like that. Um, and then everything that's happening in the United States is so impactful. And we take in, take in, take in all of this, um, you know, I can just say stuff, you know, we, we take it in and we absorb it, you know, um, you know, and it's good to again have these portals that we go to and we sit and, and we talk about and we not ignore but to be charged up and ready to go back out you know, mm -hmm. you know to do this work so thank you for presenting today um but I'm gonna always kind of bring up the state of you know uh, the state of the environment and, and and talk about that and address that and um you know um yeah you know and, and yeah. the other th the thing we don't talk about and, and <clears throat> is um, COVID, you know, is back on the rise. Um, sure is. You know, so many people have, I, I mean, I, all that flying and stuff that I was doing this summer, by the time I got to Sacramento, I had got COVID. And then you, we talk about um, self-care and, um, you know, everyone's, oh, you know, your immune system was probably down. You no. Know, you know, it's, it's, you know, that virus is still alive and, and it's mm -hmm. still moving and it's taking many shapes and forms and uh, it's from that East Coast to the West Coast, you know, um, those mm -hmm. cases are rising and we always, even with the ultra work that we're getting ready to do is to look at the millions of people worldwide that were impacted, you know, by COVID and, and have died behind, you know, mm -hmm. that pandemic that is going on and that it's still raging. Um, and people are still being, you know, affected by it. So, so even even with that, you know, to to um, in our altar work and the work that we're getting ready to do this year and to end the year to look at 2024 and that spiritual life is the sure. message I'm going to leave you guys with today. You know, uh, so <laughs> so you we have that. we're looking forward Asia, um, to your presentation too. She didn't like no comment. I'm not saying what do you do? You were gonna say hmm? you were gonna comment on hold on. Are you sorry. trying to pull up? Yeah, she is she's trying I was to gonna say I'm, I'm I'm like doing too many things at once. I can just finish <laughs> the conversation and then get to that. <laughs> um I think I was just um it's called the art of multitasking. You haven't mastered that right. one yet. I <laughs> have not. I, I tell you, I'm like, you know, over here, like multitasking. I know. So I'm 
so rested. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say. I appreciate you for bringing up the the state of our environment, though. That's really, I think, necessary. It needs to be part of every uh, conversation at this point because um, it's so it's so pervasive, right? It's like affecting everyone at this point um, in some way, even if people are denying it in whatever way that they want to deny it. Um, it's affecting all of us. And it is, it's a, it's a point of grief um, for, that we like kind of are all sharing, um, especially in these last three years, but I think has been happening even longer than that. Um, and yeah, it's like, what do we do with that? Recently, I had um, someone who was grieving a loved one, but was described grief as a an overabundance of love, of like, I have all this love that I want to share, and this person that I love is no longer here to receive it from me. It's like, what do I do with all this love, um, was her ex explanation of her experience of grief. And I feel that way on a large scale of like, I love people. I want everyone to be okay. I feel like that's why I went into the fields that I went into because I was just like, I feel like everyone should have at least their basic needs met. Um, and to have our safety be so compromised to the point where sometimes we can't even breathe the air outside is like, it's a little scary. It's a little bit um, saddening. Um, not more than a little bit, but you know what I mean? It's, um, it's a reality that we have to move within and um, and think about how we can be better to the earth, even if it's only in smaller ways.